2020 was the worst year for free speech I have seen probably in my lifetime, Mm -hmm. um, at least in the United States. People getting fired for what they said all over off campus in in, in huge numbers. You you know, you had the Harper's letter. You have 150 lefties saying, I actually don't like what's going on. And that gets dismissed, of course, by Twitter folks. Uh, Gigantic expansion of the number of professors getting fired. And we realized that, you know, we knew that if we wanted to help American society, we'd have to save free speech on campus. But it was beginning to really dawn on us that if we wanted to save free speech on campus, we were going to have to save free speech in the rest of society. Hello and welcome back to the Brendan O'Neill Show with me, Brendan O'Neill, and my special guest this week, Greg Lukianoff. Greg, welcome to the show. Hi, Brendan. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. And um, I want to ask you about what you're doing for a living now, because the last time I spoke to you, you were the president of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, the acronym of which is FIRE, which was a superb organization, which, as its name suggested, was all about defending rights in education, the rights of students and societies and academics on campuses to express themselves as they saw fit and to exercise their First Amendment rights. And speaking to you now, you are the president of the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. (laughs) So the acronym is still FIRE, but there has been a name change. The word education has been dropped and it seems that fire is expanding its remit a little bit so to kick things off could you just explain to our listeners what fire was Mm -hmm. and what fire is now hoping to become so uh fire since 1999 has been focused exclusively on higher education in the united states uh, occasionally doing education outside of that as in educating people about free speech and the first amendment But now uh, our goal is to not just keep doing everything we're doing regarding higher education, but actually continue to expand that as well, particularly when it comes to our free speech rankings, but to also extend beyond campus. Um, And we have a three-part plan, um, $75 million expansion, of which we have about a third raised so far. And uh, the the biggest part of the push is a communications, uh, also known as advertising, public education campaign. You know, because we think we're kind of, and our and our research shows this as well, that there's sort of a collective illusion at the moment pr- propagated by things like Twitter that free speech is on is an unpopular concept. That essentially it's like the new F word. Um, but every poll we look at, uh, black, white, liberal, Republican. Uh, free speech, you know, comes in very strongly as a positive value. And we think that it's mostly just a relatively small elite at the top that's spooking everybody else into pretending they don't like it or watching what they say. The other two parts of it, we're about tripling our litigation muscle. Uh, so we're looking for plaintiffs all over the U.S. Um, sorry, not not England, but um, we're, we're looking for plaintiffs. And we've already unfortunately found that there's a big unmet need there as well. And the mm-hmm. part that's dearest to my heart is the department I directly oversee, which is the research department at FIRE. Uh, and the there we've actually already been doing polling well beyond higher education for a bit. Uh, but I think that that's, the, that's some of the most interesting stuff we're finding. So just to dig down into some of that, one one of the things I always admired about FIRE, and I've met you guys on, on a number of occasions in the US, and I've been following the work of FIRE for years and years, and I've inter- interviewed you before, of course, it was always the way in which FIRE was fairly unapologetic about the speech that it defended on campus. So this wasn't just about defending speech that you and I would consider to be good speech or progressive speech or nice speech. This was about defending the right to freedom of speech more broadly in its entirety, whether you as an individual or FIRE as a group agreed with the person who was speaking or not. And why do you think that's important to to defend uh, the right to say something without necessarily according with the content of what is being said? Mm -hmm. And also, is that something you're going to draw through to the new work that you're doing now that it's the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression? Uh, absolutely. Um, we, one of the things we're even considering making it a formal part of the, of the motto, but it's just more of an mm-hmm. informal part now that we talk uh, about being un- unapologetic defenders of freedom of speech. And, you know, what we're getting at there is it seems like when people talk about free speech these days, particularly academics, um, but activists, you know, off campus, it, it always seems to start with these caveats, sort of like, 
well, free speech is, you know, the highway to hate speech and it has all these other problems. Nonetheless, I still <laughs> believe that free speech is good. And it's like, no, you're, you're, you're misunderstanding and you're definitely selling free speech short. Mm -hmm. It's like, yes, knowing people's opinion sometimes means they have troubling opinions, but it's still valuable to know them. So what, what are you apologizing for? And, you know, we, we have an, you know, an unapologetic belief that free speech is good for innovation, artistic expression, authentic living, and, of course, scientific innovation, wealth, and peace is probably the one that, that is the least appreciated. That essentially, you know, free speech is part of a system by which we uh, decide, you know, what's true uh, and who gets to decide uh, without reference to coercion or violence, mm -hmm. which had been normally the rule in human history. Hi, it's Fraser Myers here, Deputy Editor of Spiked. This is your last chance to apply for Spiked's internship program. Applications close on Monday, the 20th of June. So if you're looking to get into journalism and you want to do a six month paid placement at the best magazine in the world, now is the time to apply. Whether you want to be a writer, an editor, or an audio visual producer, this is the placement for you. You'll gain all the skills you need for a career in the media, and you'll get to help Spiked spread our pro-freedom, pro-democracy, anti-woke message. Just go to spiked-online.com forward slash interns to find out more and to apply. Remember, applications are closing very soon on Monday, the 20th of June, so don't delay. The website, again, is spiked-online.com forward slash interns. Best of luck. I think one of the things that is interesting about the times we live in, firstly, there is that caveated approach to freedom of speech that you mentioned, where people will often say, look, I, I love the idea of freedom of speech. Politicians will often pay lip service to freedom of speech because very few people want to come out and say, well, freedom of speech is just a terrible idea. So yeah. lip service is paid. People say, yeah, it's a good idea. It's a fine thing. But, however, or they, they will yeah. express a shamefacedness about the fact that they are in favor of freedom of speech, which uh, has always struck me as incredibly odd, given that freedom of speech is arguably the most important idea humankind has ever had in terms of, firstly, allowing people to express themselves, but as you've just indicated there, in terms of pushing society forward, creating the conditions for progress, the conditions for freedom more broadly, the conditions for people to enjoy the kind of liberties that we currently enjoy. All of those, of course, are gifts of earlier generations who dared to use their freedom of speech. So in terms of that caveated approach or, or that the way in which people will say, yeah, sure, it's it's nice, uh, but it's problematic or, or I'm a bit worried about being seen to support it too openly. Where do you think mm -hmm. that comes from? Th this notion that freedom of speech is a bit of an embarrassing idea that we have to be careful around rather than unapologetically defending in the public realm. To be frank, I think that the sort of shift on freedom of speech being the end all, pe uh, be all of, of the, the, the ultimate, the one defining liberal characteristic, happened largely because campuses uh, became too um, uniformly liberal. And a word I hate to use for people that believe in freedom of speech too <laughs> too progressive, you know, over a long period of time. And, and here's what I'm getting at: that essentially, you know, people argue free speech when they're weak. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, a lot of times when they actually get to power, um, they will suddenly discover, oh, actually, now I can th there's I have this pesky thing in my way. And it what didn't happen quite that consciously in, in higher education. Um, it happened more in terms of I and I think most of these people really were true believers and because I know a lot of them. But the, uh, you know, believers in free speech as an unalloyed good. Um, on campus. There were attempts starting in, even in the 1980s, even a little bit before that, to actually start policing speech that was allegedly uh, racist and sexist. I say allegedly because there's been four decades now mm -hmm. of attempts to police hate speech on campus. And it doesn't work out anything like you would think. You know, I, I wrote a book called Unlearning Liberty that came out in 2012. I co-authored a book called Coddling the American Mind. Um, and, you know, I defy you to find cases that actually look like hate speech, except for a handful. So uh, there was an attempt to to uh, sort of re reverse positions on freedom of speech on American campuses that were was fairly successful. I, I wrote a piece called this, The uh, Second Great um, Age of Political Correctness for Reason Magazine. It's like a 5,000 word feature. And I talk about how, uh, you know, people like Richard Delgado, who, who um, you know, are considered the founders of critical race theory, which is much in the news these days, Mary Matsuda, et cetera, 
um, really have wanted free speech to be, be sort of kicked out of the um, list of, of, of liberal values. They, they, you know, I, when I debated him, the very first thing he, he brought up about the ACLU was the idea that they get money from from pornographers. Like it, it was just like a whole kind of campaign. Mm. But what was protecting freedom of speech on campus to a large degree was uh, people who are from the sort of old left who are very good on free speech. And it took them dying off, retiring, being canceled um, in many cases before the the new sort of anti-free speech ideology uh, took over. And the, and the thing that's maddening about this is it's partially because higher education, and this is true in the, the UK and the mm-hmm. States, they can't admit that they are hegemonic. They cannot admit that they are powerful, wealthy, privileged institutions. Um, and therefore, you have a generation of people who are brought up thinking, oh, yeah, you know, like the, it, it's the powerful people who argue freedom of speech, um, you know. Uh, sweet little campuses, you know, they understand that it's not actually very enlightened to, to, to protect it. And it's like, oh, man, you're being completely miseducated on this. This is just because the man cannot admit that he's the man. <laughs> on that issue of um, the new generation, and it, you talk there about the older left having a firmer commitment to the ideal of freedom of speech, which is very true, especially in the United States. But there's an element of truth to it, even in the UK, where we don't have as healthy or robust a defense of freedom of speech as as some of you guys in the US have made. But do you think that the generational shift is quite important on this? So we... I I guess there is a danger that one can blame all this censorious culture that we're currently living under, cancel culture, no platforming on campuses and other means through which people are silenced. There is a danger we could blame this on 19-year-old, blue-haired, gender-fluid activists who are often quite intolerant and want to hide in a safe space and don't want to engage with difficult ideas. But of course, as you have, you mentioned your book, The Coddling of the American Mind. I want to ask you a few more questions on that later and how you think the thesis relates to things as they are now. But this generational shift has, that has taken place, do you think we sometimes overemphasize the activism of intolerant young people and underemphasize the role that older generations, for example, the founders of critical race theory, the founders of the idea that words wound, the impact that they had in terms of making campuses in particular more authoritarian spheres. Absolutely. That's one of the things that I, I, I read things where people who clearly haven't read Coddling in the American Mind yeah. re- refer sneeringly to coddling. And I always want to be kind of like, so you're disagreeing with Mayan Heights, uh, you know, position that, uh, People of my generation um, have taught younger people the habits of anxious and depressed people to tremendous harm to, mm-hmm. to that generation. And, you know, generally they haven't actually read it. So they don't know that the, <laughs> one of the whole things is, is looking at what we're teaching younger yeah. people. And to a degree, they're not just, you know, doing what, what they were told. In a lot of cases, they're doing what they told decent good people do that essentially it, it's it's considered in in some circles particularly in elite higher education kind of noble to you know get someone who's who's retrograde uh fired you know f- from a newspaper for example or from a corporation so it really is to a large degree on us and another thing that was really interesting in the polling because it is pretty clear that on the right which is funny to say, given this was not the case, you know, um, when I was a kid, but on the right, it's pretty easy to win people over to free speech these days, to free speech arguments. And for basically Americans over the age of 45, it is still pretty easy. Um, you know, people you know, around my age and up um, are actually very good on free speech. People below 30, uh, getting into Gen Z and, and, and late millennials, they, they just don't know all that much about it. Like, mm-hmm. so that's an opportunity. That's one of the reasons why we're focusing so much money and so much effort on the idea of having sort of a public education program about free speech. Unfortunately, it seems to be this big metal of roughly 30 to 45 year olds, uh, millennials essentially, who are much more free speech skeptical than any other part of um, the American population. This also, by the way, came out in the Hidden Tribes uh, survey in which they found it was about 8% of the most educated, most affluent, and by the way, second most white, um, and next to like the far right groups of people who have become more free speech skeptical. So let's talk a bit about why these younger generations might be skeptical of freedom of speech or or ignorant of the importance yeah. of freedom of speech in, in in terms of simply not knowing 
what it is, what role it has played in history, and so on. So there are obviously numerous different facets to why young people might feel this way. But the first one I wanted to touch on, on with you on is the idea that free speech is dangerous or the idea that free speech is the doorway to the expression of all forms of hatreds and libels against uh, ethnic groups and all forms of inflammatory speech that could potentially destabilize society and disrupt the social order. When I speak to uh, students in the UK on campuses here, I will often hear arguments like that. They will view freedom of speech as just far too risky, far too dangerous. It will hurt them. It will hurt people who are less privileged than them. And of course, it will give rise to more and more hate speech. And this notion, this conflation, in fact, of free speech with hate speech is becoming more and more pronounced. And I was really struck by a recent piece you wrote for uh, Newsweek, in, and you mentioned the case at Boston Emerson College, where the conservative student group there put up a sticker that said, China kinder sus. And it was clearly a critique of the Chinese regime, of China uh, in terms of its government. S sus meaning uh, slang for suspect. That's right. right. Yeah. So uh, China uh, kind uh, of suspect is, is essentially right what was being said there. And yet, even though it was a political statement, it was denounced as a form of anti-Asian bigotry and anti-Asian hatred. So isn't one of the problems in terms of the younger generation not understanding the importance of freedom of speech that more and more ideas and sometimes perfectly legitimate political and moral ideas are being refashioned as bigotry. And yep. the idea now is that those can't possibly be expressed in the public sphere. Yeah, the, the, the Emerson case, you know, is, is maddening. It, it, it's also the case that the student who dropped, dropped out after uh, being mistreated by the school is Asian American herself. About one third of the of the group that did this is Asian, and they are particularly mad that you know in that China you know beha is behaving so dictatorially in, in such an authority. When there was this hope, you know, that essentially liberalization in in China was eventually going to mean that they start having civil liberties and, and free speech. I would definitely say that hate speech is the sort of like best. Um, anti-free speech marketing job in history mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that essentially when I talk to people and the very first thing they think of when I say free speech is they immediately think of hate speech. I'm like, wow, that, that's been successful because I, as far as I'm concerned, you should be thinking about the gay rights movement. Mm -hmm. You should be thinking about people like Jonathan Rauch or or, um, uh, or Jamie Kirkrix, who, whose book, The Secret City, about gay life in the 20th century is absolutely amazing. Huge supporters of freedom of speech. They're very aware that that movement happened because of freedom of speech. Same thing with the civil rights movement. You know, John Lewis would talk about free speech being uh, without free speech. Uh, the, the civil rights movement would have been a bird without wings. And of course, the women's rights movement as well. The, these all, it, it, it wasn't a coincidence that these things started happening when American free speech culture and American free speech law really started becoming much stronger um, in the late 50s. Now, I do try to, to be, try to be as sympathetic and get myself in their heads as much as possible. Um, the lack, the, the uh, homogeneity of the politics of K through 12 teachers and higher ed does mm -hmm. play a role because you're basically, since there is a, a larger movement of free speech skepticism on the left, you shouldn't be surprised to see more of that being taught uh, on the way down. Now, Back when I wrote for the Huffington Post, um, which I wrote for for a good 10 years, I, I never got time to write this article that was trying to explain, just, to, just trying to be as sympathetic about it as possible. And in the U.S., um, you know, the First Amendment ha is so well protected, and, and legally speaking, it, it is very well protected, that after decades of this, you start getting into some of the least sympathetic speech. It's actually the sign that it's working really well that you start getting the things like animal crush videos in the Westboro Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. Now, if nobody has taught you anything else about freedom of speech other than the Westboro Baptist Church, which nobody likes, then I, I can see some of that skepticism. It also gets associated with the anti-bullying movement. I think that that was a big, uh, a big contributor to, to sort of free speech skepticism. Meanwhile, anything that looks like actual patterns of behavior of that, like real bullying, particularly if it's discriminatory, you, you know, there are mechanisms for, for, uh, for, for punishing that. So I think that some of it comes from, you know, some natural evolution. I think some of it comes from lack of, lack of viewpoint diversity. And I, and the, and what we're trying to rectify as best we can is that nobody's made the argument um, about the importance of freedom of speech. And by the way, Freedom for, for speech, even when it's, you know, for the, the, the old quote from the Supreme Court is for the thought that you hate. But 
the thing that we always try to argue, because it ends up happening a lot on campus, that people will say, you know, the, the way we use the misinformation rationale now, that, that essentially is like, well, I'm just trying to protect people from, you know, your your uncle saying that lizard people live under the Denver airport. And, you know, my response is, <laughs> well, um, don't you think it's kind of important to know that your uncle thinks that <laughs> lizard <laughs> people live under the Denver airport, even if it's actually because it's such a crazy idea? Yeah. Absolutely. And I think one of the interesting things you mentioned there, the the anti-bullying movement and the way in which lots of people have been convinced over a period of time through their education and through their what's inculcated to them through their experiences and, and how they're brought up, is this notion that free speech can be wounding, it can be hurtful, it can feel like bullying, it can feel vindictive. And of course, people are often encouraged to go to a safe space, take refuge from difficult ideas and things that they find controversial. But one of the great ironies there, of course, is that it's censorship is far more of a bullying force than freedom of speech. And if you look at, you will know this better than most people, if you look at some of the things that have happened on campuses over the past few years, under the banner of um, protecting people from supposedly hurtful speech, extreme acts of bullying and even threats of violence have been carried out. If we look at what happened at Evergreen College with Brett Weinstein, for example, or at Yale University, the Halloween costume controversy, which you obviously know, know about very well. And here in the UK, we've seen people being hounded off campuses. We've seen supposed TERFs, that is, trans exclusionary radical feminists who don't believe men can become women they've been threatened they've been banned they've been told that they've been called every name under the sun often misogynistic names so there's an irony there isn't there that the way in which we're told that the safe space will protect you from bullying and hurtful speech but the ideology of the safe space actually sanctions bullying against people who are deemed to be heretical or controversial yeah, no, absolutely. So we talk about in Coddling the American Mind, we talk about what we call the three great untruths, because what we're arguing there um, is that it's as if we are giving young people the worst imaginable advice, stuff that is not well grounded in ancient wisdom, modern psychology, and stuff that will actually make you miserable if you actually believe it. And uh, the great untruth number three is that life is a battle between good people and evil people. Yeah. And I feel like for most of my life, um, you'd seen greater sort of moral sophistication and complexity, you know, in American society, also including in the art we consume, you know, like the fact that the most popular shows in the country were The Sopranos mm -hmm. and The uh, Mad Men and, and Breaking Bad, you know, it, 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 it all shows that did great jobs of showing genuine moral conundrums with no clear good guys or bad guys, um, or in some cases, clear bad guys, but no clear good guys. I thought that we were reaching some greater level of sophistication, but I do think that partially because free speech got sort of recast um, primarily through the lens of, of, of bullying, there was a sense like it is a battle. It's between it's between good people and evil bullies. And one thing that I think was lost on a lot of people, because there's a there's a kind of like um, acquired sort of um, naivete, like, like it, if you want to think of yourself as a moral person, you know, particularly in sort of like the campus ideology, you can't actually say things like, well, you know, people are going to act like people here. So what happened when you start introducing some of these anti-bullying remedies and a, a lot of these things for uh, for reporting your friends, there were some socially intelligent you know, of 14, 15 year olds who are kind of like, oh, that's the way I take care of my friends now. That That's the way I go after people I don't <laughs> like. Um, and to think otherwise is just not to understand human nature. But then again, there's an effort to not understand human nature um, uh, th that goes goes along with this. So I think that we uh, we're, we're currently allowing people who might once have just been dismissed as bullies themselves, uh, a sort of outlet um, that allows them to, to to push people they dislike around. And instead of saying, come on, like everyone's entitled to their opinion, an older idiom that was everywhere when I was a kid and practically nowhere now, um, they, they actually, they don't just feel like they had the right to do it. They felt like they had a duty to do it. And they're also entitled to being praised for getting, uh, for getting that, um, you know, book that's being published that has a premise that they don't like out of the publishing company. And I think that's very well put. And then alongside that, or, or I guess infusing that is the fact that there are significant numbers of people now, and this is something you've talked about, who, who do 
experience critical ideas or controversial ideas or contrary ideas that run counter to their own worldview. They do actually experience them as an existential threat. And mm -hmm. uh, the, the thing that strikes me, and I, I sometimes have difficulty really getting my head around this, but when I speak to students on campuses here in the UK, as I've done a number of times over the past few years, uh, what becomes quite clear quite quickly is that they're not making it up when they say that words hurt them. I mean, th that's yeah. actually how they experience it. Now, of course, there will be some cynical players in a lot of this who will use that language to cl uh, clamp down on, on views that they just don't like. But for mm. many people, it really is experienced in that way. And I've seen people who have been genuinely triggered by something I've said to the extent that they've had to be helped from the room. So isn't this uh, also this quite worrying uh, psychic fragility that some young people seem to experience. Isn't that also uh, springing from the idea that words are a form of violence and the bullying as well? Because I, I guess if you say to people that words are really potentially explosive and they could hurt you, the logic to that is either you run away from them in absolute panic or you use menace and threats and sometimes even violence itself to counter those words in order to defend your own self-esteem. So this ideology is actually creating a, a pretty dangerous situation. Oh yeah, no, no, uh, that's one of the most horrifying things is that, you know, when Haidt and I wrote the original article of Coddling the American Mind, making the argument that we're teaching young people the habits of anxious and depressed people, in addition to the habits of uh, illiberal habits, the habits of censors, you know, the data wasn't all in yet about whether or not there was a mental health crisis on campus. We were hearing that mental health resources were being push their limit, you know, from people that we knew on campus, but nothing really prepared us for how bad the mental health incomes uh, outcomes were going to be uh, over the next couple of years. And, and they, they've all gotten worse ever since, um, you, you know, uh, coddling uh, the original article came out in, 20, in 2015. So you do have this kind of self-fulfilling prediction problem uh, going on. And I do think that if you tell people, you know, that words really can harm them and they'll never recover, you shouldn't be shocked when they act like they do because because what they think they're hearing is something that's going to hurt, hurt them forever. And this is why I, I end up having to explain and come to the defense sometimes for the old sticks and stones saying, because it's intentionally misrepresented all the time, or maybe not even intentionally, maybe people really don't get what it meant. They, they will say things like, well, we used to say that sticks and stones break my bones, but names will never hurt me. But now we know that names can hurt. And I'm like, you think that John Stuart Mill didn't think know that words can be hurtful? <laughs> uh, like, you don't think that like the founding fathers knew that? Like mm. everybody knows that. Like, but the saying is a way to make them hurt less and to put them in perspective. And that's why you teach a kids, you know, particularly in a de democratic society, you know, the ideal of a culture of dignity, uh, uh, as it was called, that essentially, you know, you're like th this is up to you. Uh, there's going to be mean people out there. You can't just make them all go away, thankfully. Um, so you, we're going to give you some tools for handling this. And you have to uh, refocus on, you know, not caring as much what people think, getting an ability to sort of like dismiss some of the insults. But instead, what we're telling people is, oh, yeah, words can definitely harm you and you'll be you'll, you'll be done for forever. So much of what we're teaching people, particularly on campus, but also in K through 12, there, there's a cruelty to it because yeah. it's like because if you understand this stuff it's kind of you know for a fact right now that anxious and depressed people are showing up in record numbers on campus and you're still whispering into their ears you know that you're going to be doomed if you hear things you don't like that or, or for that matter when you get to the sort of the like privilege ideology like the idea of kind of like oh by the way i know you're all anxious and depressed uh the, over, the overwhelming majority of you by the way are uh, oppressed and oppressors at the same time. There's nothing you can do about it. You're very fragile, be easily hurt. You're part of an evil system. Um, like all of these kind of things, it's kind of like, this is messed up. This is a, the, the, and I also think, of course, it's not true what, what we're teaching them, but as far as its potential harm to for, for uh, anxiety and depression, I think we're seeing, you know, it's one of the reasons why this is going off the charts now. We often think of America as a nation founded on liberty, but many of the freedoms that are taken for granted today had to be struggled for and fought over. Often these battles took place in the courtroom, and this is the focus of the Wondrium series, Liberty on Trial in America, Cases That Defined Freedom, which I really want you to check out. 
Over 24 eye-opening episodes, law professor Douglas Linder takes you through 400 years of court battles that have defined and redefined what it means to be a free citizen. It explores the key courtroom clashes over religious freedom in the 1600s, the rights of slaves in the 19th century, the 20th century battles for civil rights, and of course, Roe v. Wade, which is now as relevant as ever. This Wondrium series is a must watch. If you want to learn more about where our freedoms come from, Wondrium has so many brilliant programs to watch or listen to. After Liberty on Trial, why not check out their series on the Magna Carta or the US Constitution? Wondrium really has every subject covered. Wondrium is focused on helping us become better versions of ourselves. You can explore audio and video courses on hundreds of topics taught by university professors. You can watch documentaries to help you learn more about the world around you. And you can find video tutorials that teach you new skills like photography, cooking, and more. All of Wondrium's content is world-class and credible. It is presented by experts who know their stuff, and it is always ad-free. I want you to sign up for Wondrium today. Wondrium is offering my listeners a free trial plus 20% off an annual plan. To get this offer, you just need to visit our special URL, wondrium.com slash Brendan. Again, that's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash Brendan. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, expansion of, of FIRE's remit and the fact that you are now carrying on with the education stuff, which is great. That's incredibly important, but also looking beyond that too. And it seems pretty clear that there has been, I don't know how to describe this, and um, but there seems to have been a leaking of the campus culture into society more broadly, or maybe the fact that the campus culture has its origins in society more broadly is becoming clearer. I don't quite, uh, it's a bit of a chicken and egg thing that I can't yeah. quite work I out. But I think both are happening. <laughs> yeah, I think both I think both things at the same time. But there, there, it's very clear that a lot of the censorious antics in contemporary society outside of the campus, it certainly seems to be influenced by some of the language that has been developed on campuses over the past few decades. So for example, in the UK right now, we have um, groups of Islamist protesters who are protesting outside cinemas about a new film called The Lady of Heaven, which they consider to be blasphemous and, and insulting to Muhammad. And what's so striking about it is that they are not using the fire and brimstone language of, of blasphemy and uh, how dare you insult uh, this holy person. They're using campus style language. They are mm. saying, we have the right not to be offended and we have the right to be protected from insults to our identity. So they've really co-opted that kind of politically correct language, I guess, to justify what I consider to be their archaic attempt to shut down a film they don't like. And then if you look in the, in the US, you've had the situation where we've had there have been protests against Dave Chappelle and his specials on Netflix, which I think are superb, but that's really exploded into the real world outside of campus, but a similar kind of language is being used. You know, this is going to hurt people. His jokes about trans people in particular will uh, damage people's lives, make them feel worthless, make them feel bad, and therefore Netflix shouldn't air this stuff. So it, it, it's become, is that one of the reasons you guys have decided to, you know, take on this whole new project, I guess, of defending freedom of speech across the United States? Because it's reaching kind of crisis levels, not just on the campus, but outside of it as well. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, um, FIRE is founded in 99. Um, we are all the, uh, we, we come from different political perspectives. You know, I have about 85 employees. Um, we, we genuinely actually try to have a, 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 an organization where uh, not just do people vote for different candidates, but they vote for uh, different main party candidates. Like when yeah. I worked at the ACLU back in 99, you know, sure, some people vote for Democrats, some people vote Green, but the insti an institution that is legitimately like for real nonpartisan in that we have Republicans and Democrats work working next to each other. Um, has always been a big part of the vision. Uh, and because we attract people who are, you know, old school uh, f f free speechers, there, there's been, uh, they've been coming to us, you know, almost as long as I've been around, uh, which was 2001. 
um, saying that fire should extend beyond campus? And my answer was always, nope, we want to f- specialize in higher ed. And yes, we do. We do actually kind of feel like it might be to, to, uh, the atheist here, like, like, like religious imagery. It might be our destiny one <laughs> one day uh, yeah. to, to, to go beyond uh, campus. And we actually feel kind of called to that. Um, but I wanted to make sure that we were we had sufficient coverage on campus before we considered any kind of expansion. And I felt like the final uh, piece to fall into place was being able to pull students directly on campus so you could actually start having a rigorous rating to say, like, listen, if you if you want free speech, go to University of Chicago over Williams, you know, uh, for, for example. So we started talking with, with Enfire, like maybe maybe at our 25th anniversary, you know, um, which was is 2024. Um, maybe we'll that's when we announced we'll extend a, a outward from campus as well. But 2020 was the worst year for free speech I have seen probably in my lifetime, mm. um, at least in the United States. Uh, you know, but uh, people uh, people getting fired for what they said all over off campus in, in, in huge numbers. You, you know, you had the Harper's letter. You have 150 lefties saying, I actually don't like what's going on. And that gets dismissed, of course, by Twitter folks. Um, a gigantic expansion of the number of professors getting fired. Yeah. Um, and we realized that, you know, we knew that if we wanted to help American society, we'd have to save free speech on campus. But it was beginning to really dawn on us that if we wanted to save free speech on campus, we were going to have to save free speech <laughs> in the rest of society. These, these things are too, and it's one of the reasons why we're not just doing litigation, we're trying to teach the, uh, about a sophisticated philosophy of freedom of speech um, that, that all Americans should appreciate, even when they're not legally bound under the First Amendment. So on that expansion and the pursuit of your destiny, which is to um, have fire across the country defending all sorts of people, I wanted to ask you, it might be a difficult question, but I wanted to ask you why sure. about the necessity for that. And I guess one of the things that keeps coming into my mind is that other organizations are not doing what they ought to be doing. And I am thinking of an organization you've just named there, which is the ACLU, mm. which has proven a little bit unwilling or incapable, I'm not sure which, to defend freedom of speech in the contemporary era as enthusiastically as they defended it in the past. Let's put it like that. And uh, I know lots of former members of the uh, ACLU, like Wendy Kaminer, for example, have argued that there has been a slightly problematic generational churn. There's been an embrace of the politics of identity and the politics of diversity, which sometimes great against the universalizing principle of freedom of speech. So is that one of the reasons? Do you think there is, in comparison with America in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, uh, when the ACLU in particular was pretty uh, hardcore in its defense of freedom of speech, do you think there's a lack in broader American society now of organizations that are willing to say, listen, freedom of speech for everyone, regardless of what they think and say. Yeah. I mean, that's one thing that the, that this move has been interpreted, um, you know, in a lot of media as a, as a repudiation of the ACLU. And I always <laughs> disappoint people by saying, listen, you know, we've worked with the ACLU mm-hmm. on campus on free speech issues in the past. We hope to work with them in the future. And I, and I know we will. So, you know, we, we wish the best for them. One thing that I, I am, however, perfectly willing to say is that one advantage that FIRE is going to have over, over the ACLU when it comes to free speech is that the, the ACLU has 19 issue areas. It does 19 different things that, that, that include freedom of speech. Um, and oftentimes, you know, the ones in the news, you know, whether it's um, LGBT rights, for example, you know, tends to get m- more of the juice. We're doing just freedom of speech. Um, freedom of speech is our cause. It, it's what a- animates us. We don't want to have the mission creep because we think that that can eventually dilute uh, dilute your message. Um, but uh, yeah, so, you know, we, but we ultimately would like to become, you know, the top defenders of, of, of free speech in the United States. I, I hope that, you know, just like uh, when I was a kid, you know, first generation Americans are often this way, that, you know, this, uh, this really exceptional idea of, of, of freedom of speech. I hope that we can be the one who introduced a whole new generation to this history they don't know, but also this idea, you know, this kind of brave, bold idea that it's just valuable to know what people really think, no matter what. In relation to what's going on in American society in terms of where censorship is coming from and where the the new intolerance is coming from, I really wanted to ask your opinion on 
what is not particularly usefully referred to as wokeness, which I think has become a, a term that people use because they don't quite know how to describe the culture we all feel that we're living through, which is one that can seem... Do you have a preferred way to refer to it, Bre- Brendan? I, I'm, just, I'm just curious. Like, is there is there something that you think is more precise or more accurate or... No, I use wokeness all the time because <laughs> okay. I, like everyone else, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a neat term that will kind of encapsulate some of these problems. But I I often think it might not quite nail it, but I think it's quite useful because people tend to understand where you're coming from when you say it. They know generally the culture that you're talking about. And I wanted to ask you about that because one of the things I find quite frustrating is that wokeness is seen as as progressive. It is seen as left-wing and the heir to the civil rights movements of the 1960s. And uh, it's often justified in terms of LGBTQ rights, and it would see itself as coming from feminism and so on. But I've always thought that there is actually an extraordinary contradiction between those earlier incredibly positive struggles for freedom and equality of the 50s and the 60s through to the 1980s against racism for female equality, for gay equality, these wonderful leaps forward for human society that... America and the UK and other countries were very lucky to experience. There's a difference between those things and what we have today, which is presented as being similar, but it actually often feels very divisive, intolerant, reprimanding of anyone who doesn't go along with every single part of the new ideology. So tonally and politically and ideologically, isn't it time that more people called into question the idea that this campus culture or wokeness or however we want to refer to it, call into question the idea that this is anything progressive and really yeah. start to strip away what's really going on here. Yeah, no, it, it the, the biggest change um, from like the campus left uh, for practically all of my life up until pretty recently um, has been this shift towards wanting top-down solutions, wanting power, giving power more power in the thought that it will help you. Because, you know, the 60s uh, and the 70s, you know, or 80s, or for that matter, the 80s and 90s, uh, younger people were saying, no, you're not our parents. You don't get to tell us what to do. You don't get to scold us if we're being immoral um, under, under your definition. But it's really shifted to a situation where, uh, and this really took over like lightning struck in around 2014, right, right towards the end of 2013, uh, that you have these younger, the younger generation people who they're, they're actually, they want to give power, the people in charge, more power so that they will protect, you know, usually uh, victim groups or some, uh, oftentimes some unnamed second or third group who, who, who needs that protection. And I think that that's why I really stress the idea of sort of like the lack of viewpoint diversity in higher ed creating uh, so many of these problems. Because if you can rely on the administration being essentially sympathetic to your position, then, you know, after a couple of decades of this, you can understand how people are like, well, yeah, no, but power should have more power because every time I want them to do something to shut down the, the mean conservatives, they say they can't because blah, 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 free speech. I hope that this is going to get a little bit clearer, though, as some of these young people come out into the, I hesitate to use the term real world, but the political world, that they're going to be giving a weapon to people they completely oppose. Now, what's funny, though, is that as much as I hope that this gets across, uh, when I would have these discussions in uh, San Francisco, which was definitely um, uh, sort of like the least pro-free speech place um, (laughs) that I could remember, and and, and I know that may sound like really surprising to people, but in 99, when I I interned at the ACLU, the free speech kids, you know, oftentimes weren't considered the cool kids, even though that was a town that relied relied heavily on the First Amendment uh, for artistic expression, for uh, being being able to continue to to exist and you know 10 years later when i'm talking to my friends who live there uh and they still want their you know limitations on free speech in the name of sort of enlightened censorship i'm like you do understand that you know george w bush is in charge of everything now like you'd want to <laughs> give them that power and it somehow didn't seem to it, it somehow didn't seem to connect uh, unless or until it's actually someone they don't like enforcing it. So I don't I don't know what like what's really going to what's really going to change this. But it is a very strange thing to mm. hear people assuming that if power had more power, it would work out well for you. 
How Woke Won, the new spiked book by Joanna Williams is out now. It is all about the woke takeover of our institutions and how we as ordinary people can fight back. I cannot recommend it enough. Make sure you order your copy now. You can get it on Amazon or go to spiked-online.com slash shop. That's spiked-online.com slash shop. You mentioned there the First Amendment, and uh, I wanted to ask you about the First Amendment. This is a discussion you and I have had before, because I've always viewed the First Amendment as a blessing and a curse. I think it's far more a blessing, by the way. I'm very much in favor of the First Amendment. We're very envious of it. Us lonely liberals in the UK are envious of the fact that you have an amendment, a, a bill of rights, which says that the government cannot restrict freedom of speech. That is extraordinary in world history. It's a wonderful thing. But one of the things that I've often thought is that in a sense, it makes the battle for freedom of speech easier because it means that you can appeal to constitutional law and people's constitutional rights and strike down unconstitutional bans on people's right to express themselves. And you guys have done that very successfully uh, over the past couple of decades to great effect and to great, you know, the, to, to, to the bolstering of liberty. But there is also, isn't there, and you touch on this in your um, piece for Newsweek recently about how fire is changing and, and what it's going to be doing. There is also that necessity alongside the use of the uh, people's perfectly legitimate First Amendment rights to also defend freedom as a cultural good as, and as a cultural experience, something that people live and breathe on a daily basis rather than something they enjoy as a consequence of the Bill of Rights. So how do you strike that balance and which do you think is more important now? Or do you think they play an equal role in, in the battles that you face? Great question. And yeah, I remember actually having this discussion in my backyard in Brooklyn, <laughs> uh, you, you know, ages ago, because my, my mom's British. So so like there is this idea that uh, the rights in England are better, in the UK, are better protected by not having things written down in the Constitution um, as opposed to the US. And I, you know, I believe in free speech culture, but I also am really glad we have a First Amendment, partially because having it be that sort of frankly, rigid in the law means that when your society loses its mind, you know, however temporarily, <laughs> uh, that free speech isn't gone forever. Mm -hmm. And as we've all noticed, at the, you know, at the, by the time we're this age, society loses its mind quite, quite often. And yeah. interestingly, that being said, I've never seen it quite uh, as strange uh, as I saw in 2020. Like that was definitely a moment where if we didn't have the strong protection of the First Amendment, we'd be in deep trouble. So I definitely, you know, I think the First Amendment's great. Um, I think it's necessary, but not sufficient to get the full benefit of freedom of speech. And unlike, you know, and then this, and by the way, I should mention this before, like we're genuinely nonpartisan, like Republicans yeah. come up with terrible free speech suggestions all the time, and we don't hesitate for a, sec a second to fight them. But for example, you know, like the uh, the attempt to sort of impose free speech standards via the law is something that we don't like, uh, but we would like companies to voluntarily protect the free speech rights of their employees, to not simply fire them every time they say something controversial, uh, to maybe say that, yeah, it, it, it's actually a bad trend if we decide that every single, you know, uh, widget factory company, you know, also me uh has to have an, a political identity that means that dissenters get get fired right away so i think that free speech culture at the moment well i think free speech culture in general is actually more important than free speech law mm -hmm. but this is this is what i mean that if you end up uh eroding free speech culture with time the law will erode too because i mean judges aren't you know they're not they're not robots they they, they, they come from somewhere so even for, for backing it up in the law, it's important. But there's also places that are rightfully outside the reach of federal power, um, or, or at least, you know, to some degree. And there it's still the case that it's valuable to know what people really think. It's, you know, people should be entitled to their own opinions. Um, so and that's probably where we're going to take you know, some of the most flack, because there are lawyers in particular who hate the concept of free speech 
culture in part because, and on this they're absolutely right, it can be badly abused and people mm-hmm. can be very hypocritical about saying it in one case um, and not in the other. But we were almost done a favor by the situation of Dave Weigel um, at the Washington Post. And this happened the day we announced that we were expanding our mission. Um, and this is a guy who, who he, he uh, retweeted a, um, a, a joke. And I, I assume this, is, this was in response to an article that had been going around saying that the number of women who self-report being bisexual had like quadrupled. And when you looked into the data, these were oftentimes women who actually didn't have sex with, with other women. They just kind of thought of themselves mm-hmm. that way. And so uh, Dave Weigel retweeted this joke saying that all women are bi, uh, either bisexual or bipolar. An old joke, um, you know, the, you know, slightly edgy. Uh, <laughs> and this led to him being immediately suspended mm. from uh, from the Washington Post. And, you know, my uh, what a, it was a nice opportunity to, to, to make make it in a sort of modest form to, mm. uh, as we're introducing people to it. Just saying, like, listen, people ask me what the difference between free speech culture and free speech law is. Uh, I'm not saying that I think it should be illegal to have suspended Dave Weigel, but free, but arguing for free speech culture is there should be a thumb on the scale for allowing people to, you know, uh, crack jokes, to say their honest opinions um, in, in favor of, of freedom of speech uh, as a cultural value. Yeah, that's a very good example of that. You mentioned the right there. And the thing that strikes me about the era we live in, and I think this applies to both the US and the UK, is that the right often seem like more genuine defenders of freedom of speech than the left. The left has lost the freedom mojo to a large extent. And as you were saying earlier, it now seems to view some form of top-down intervention or top-down control as the solution to most of society's problems, whereas the right often takes a position that seems more pro-freedom of speech. But it can, even from the right, it can be quite shallow, can't it? And one thing that I was I wanted to get your opinion on was the question of whether anti-wokeness goes too far sometimes and can end up itself being authoritarian. So I'm thinking of in the US, for example, critical race theory books sometimes being withdrawn from schools or from educational environments. There's the libs of TikTok phenomenon. I love libs of TikTok, but what I don't like, because it, because it's very, very funny, but I don't like the way in which some of those teachers are then witch hunted online and in some cases complaints are made to their school and they're thrown out for a video that they made just to camera for themselves and their followers. And that seems to me to be unjust. So it, there's a danger that the revolt against wokeness will end up repeating some of the sins of wokeness in terms of applying an authoritarian uh, measure to speech that people on the right, in this case, don't like. Yeah. Well, the explosion in legislation relating to um, quote unquote CRT, um, I say quote unquote, because, you know, the person who popularized this as being sort of a blanket term for uh, campus style identity politics is Chris Rufo, who, by the way, you know, actually points out that he's not actually referring to like the ideology, the, the legal doctrine, the legal sort of field of study uh, originating with people like Richard Ogato, Mary Matsud in the 80s. He's talking basically just about identity politics. And we, we wrote a 5,000 word piece last summer, you know, trying to parse through the different legal status of things like, you know, can state governments be involved in deciding what should be taught in K through 12? Yeah. And in the, in the US, they can, but it still means you can criticize it like crazy. It's a little more complicated when you talk about K through 12 libraries. Mm. But there's been a lot of focus on that. Meanwhile, uh, Rob DeSantis in Florida had one of these laws applied to higher education, and that has gotten a tiny fraction of the coverage of some of these other ones that, that, that may or may not be constitutional. There is no question the one that Florida passed applied to higher education is unconstitutional. It's not even a close call, yeah. and it's not getting nearly as much attention. So I'm a little bit scared that the right, like the, the committed right and the committed left are both seeing uh, a liberalism as the only answer to win the culture war, which of course, there's no winning the culture war. Nobody's going to permanently win it. When you have people on the right saying that this is such a, this is an existential moralistic fight and therefore we have to play dirty. Like actually under those circumstances, the ground rules and in the US, freedom of speech is one of those actually gets more important, not less. So Greg, my last question for you is really just to tie, try and tie together 
what has been your life's work, essentially, which is the, you've mentioned The Coddling of the American Mind, which you wrote with Jonathan Haidt, which was an extraordinary bestseller, really looking at not simply the crisis of freedom, but at all the different trends and antecedents to the current culture that we live in, including the illiberal culture that we live in. And of course, you've been working with fire for a long time, and now you're going to be taking fire onto a whole new level. So I guess the question I have, which is really probably too broad a one to answer now, but we can start people thinking about it, is how do we repair the... uh, the spirit of freedom, I guess. How do we repair what individuals need within themselves, I suppose, in order to understand that they are free, that it's a good thing to be free, and that they should support the right of other people to live freely too? Because that's really what's fallen apart. If you educate people into seeing themselves as fragile and susceptible to mental illness and crisis and PTSD and all these other problems that they will be afflicted by simply by negotiating life in a free society, then that's going to manifest itself in many different ways. So how do we restore that sense of, I guess, robustness or the aspiration to autonomy that can then lead to society itself being more free, more experimental, and ultimately more progressive in the long term? As a, it's a great question, um, and I will uh, show the epistemic humility I so often <laughs> preach by saying, uh, uh, honestly, we, you, we don't know. Um, however, there are things that we're going to try, and one of them is that massive public education campaign. Like I said, I think we're in an emperor's new clothes situation because I think that it's not so much that people, you know, at least above a certain age, don't believe in free speech anymore. So they're kind of afraid to say so. So, so there's some good news when you're trying to recover something that people already believe. It's a lot easier than trying to change culture. Changing culture, you know, as you get to younger people, you got to reach them earlier. You've got to explain how, you know, if they care about any, any of these minority rights, they also like free speech, whether they know it or not. I think it's important to approach these things with new arguments to sort of make these things new, fresh and alive. But unfortunately, what seems to happen a lot uh, in history is that people need to learn it to a degree the hard way that essentially it is when, you know, um, a, uh, a politician you like decides to pass some kind of ban on something and you realize, wow, that 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 worked out really ugly and not the way you expected, which is any First Amendment lawyer can tell you. It's kind of like, no, it's not. It's it, it, this is going to go. This is going to be used to let power, you know, punish who it wants to punish. It's not going to save the world. That's not the way these things work. Um, I did think, and I do hope at least a little bit that seeing, you know, like what's going on in Ukraine or what's going on in Turkey or what's going on in China. Uh, prompts at least some people to, to better appreciate freedom. But I will say, like like in, in, in the summer of 2020, watching those brave Hong Kong um, protesters, you know, uh, f- fighting for democracy and freedom of speech and it getting very little traction in the United States was... Uh, a little heartbreaking because like these are people who who get it they, they they get what the alternative to freedom and free speech actually can and does look like uh and it was largely falling on deaf ears i mean my long-term hope for freedom of speech why i think why i'm long-term hopeful even if i'm not so short-term hopeful is that freedom of speech works really well it's it's easier to be authentic it's easier to be yourself um societies that actually do allow free speech have have genuine, actually, for that matter, strategic advantages over others because they can t- they can see where their problems are coming from in a way that you know you run a dictatorship and it's kind of like I, I I'm not going to tell you know I'm not going to tell the boss like who, who's in in trouble um, and you know we're going to try to be creative um, that's something I love about Fire is we do always try to be creative we do documentaries and comic books and books about psychology um, we're we're going to try everything and then some uh, in order to reach more people to preach the good word of free speech. Greg, thank you very much. Thanks, Brandon. That was was fun.